So good evening and welcome to the regular Board of Education meeting. It's Monday, September 11, 2017. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The mission of the White Plains City School District is to educate and inspire all students while nurturing their dreams so they learn continually, think critically, and pursue their aspirations and contribute to a diverse and dynamic world. Good evening. Uh, this evening, we'd like to ask for a moment of silence and reflection. I uh, think about Mr. Anthony Capobianco, 30 years in elementary, both uh, Ridgeway and George Washington and the Intermediate School, and Mr. Arthur Rondau, 26 years, White Plains High School, Science Department, and, science, and Chair of the Science Department. And of course, we also ask for your reflection and thoughts related to those who lost loved ones and friends on 9-11, and uh, those who continue to suffer based on that terrible day. Thank you. Next, we'll have announcement. Any announcements by board members? I can. Oh, okay. Oh, just real quick. Um, beginning of the school year, we had two football games. Saw Charlie at the second, and saw you guys at the first. Um, looks like it could be a long season, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. A lot of people showed up, which was very nice. Caught a swim meet. Again, nice, nice activity. Seventy plus kids on the uh, on the swim team, which is great activity, and uh, some uh, caught two field hockey games as well. Uh, again, a lot of new blood, a lot of new activity. I guess the girls' field hockey team exceeded their score all all of last year's scoring in one game uh, this year, and they matched their wins for last year as well. So it's exciting and. Uh, it's nice to see the new blood. It's nice to see people uh, very excited and doing well. And uh, it's just the beginning of the year. And then we've got the open, opening days coming up. The buildings look nice just when going through them for the sporting events. Looked like they've all been uh, hard at work putting them back together. And the shiny floors always look great, Frank. So thank you. Um, just to echo um, what Jim said, but really um, also to um, also highlight the, the swim carnival at the high school. Uh, schools come from all over to be there. Our high school is always in tip-top shape, and our pool is def definitely a destination pool. So thank you. Thank you, Frank, for that as well. Mr. Dolan and his and staff. Yes. Anything else? Okay. So this evening, we have a very special announcement, and uh, Principal Doherty is here with us this evening, and she is going to reveal <coughs> the next four inductees to the White Plains High School Hall of Fame. Good evening, Principal Doherty. Good evening. This information is no longer embargoed <laughs> as of this minute. It's my pleasure to announce the next four distinguished White Plains High School graduates who've been chosen for induction into the White Plains High School Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame not only celebrates the achievements of truly outstanding graduates, but it also recognizes the contributions of our high school teachers and staff. And it's a real source of pride for our students. The four graduates who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame this fall will join 74 other distinguished gradu graduates ranging from the class of 1921 to the class of 1984. Each has been selected by a hardworking committee of school and community representatives who review all nominations each year. Here, in the order in which they graduated from White Plains High School, are the 2017 inductees. <clears throat> Ralph Waite, class of 1946. Mr. Waite, who passed away at the age of 85 in 2014, was an ordained minister, book editor, and political activist who ran for Congress three times in Southern California. But you may know him best as John Walton, the father in the long-running TV series, The Waltons. 
Mr. Waite enjoyed a 55-year career on Broadway, in films, and on television. Our second inductee, Dr. Robert L. Johnson, class of 1964. Dr. Johnson, an internationally recognized expert in the field of adolescent and young adult medicine, is the Dean of Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Dr. Johnson has received numerous awards and is chair of the New Jersey Governor's Advisory Council on HIV AIDS and related bloodborne pathogens. Georgia Kakandis, class of 1977. Ms. Kakandis is a respected executive movie producer and an on-set physical producer who over a 30-year career has produced 17 films and served as a unit production manager for 23 others. Some of you may fondly remember George's dad, John Kakandis, a teacher, coach, and administrator in the White Plains Public Schools for 40 years. And finally, David Levy, class of 1980. David Levy, president of Turner Broadcasting, is one of the most respected leaders in media. He oversees the company's portfolio of domestic entertainment, kids and young adult networks and businesses, including TBS, TNT, Cartoon Network, and Turner Classic Movies. Mr. Levy joins his former colleague at Turner, recently retired chairman and CEO Phil Kent, who was inducted into the White Plains High School uh, Hall of Fame in 2008. This distinguished group of alumni will be inducted into the Hall of Fame in a ceremony on Wednesday, November 15th in the Media Center at the high school at 3 o'clock. We really hope that everyone joins us. Everyone's welcome. Thank you. And just a, a plug for that committee, and in particular, Amy Geiger, who now will kill me for mentioning her, but <laughs> she is an extraordinary woman. Um, I really can't say enough about her, runs our community service program, is a tireless advocate for our schools, and most, most of all, really loves our kids. So shout out to Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, do we have any communications? Do we have any public participation? Okay, since we do not, we'll move, move right into the superintendent's report. Thank you very much and good evening again, everybody. Um, first up this evening, we, we have a number of reports for you. And first up this evening, we're, we're happy to welcome Mr. Gary West um, to walk us through uh, an update related to summer school. Mr. West, do you, would you like to control or do you want to just go up there and click through? Uh, I can click. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks for allowing us this opportunity to kind of highlight what we do in summer school. So I'm just going to be as brief as I can, and I may not speak in order of these slides. I assume that you'll be able to view them um, if you want to read all the information. But, um, you know, our elementary summer school program is for pre-K through second grade. And just to let you know, those are the grades they are coming from, not the grades that they're going into, which is why pre-K is included. So these are entering K through third graders. And we identify the kids um, in, in K1 and 2 based on the Dibble scores in the district, because that's our common literacy um, data point. So kids who have not met, yet met Benchmark are invited. Um, not all of the kids are able to attend, but we get a commitment from the family. And we had about 260 that attended this year. The pre-K kids are selected based on the dial. The primary focus of our program has always been on literacy. So the kids are in smaller groups than they are typically during the school year, and we try to group them as homogeneously as we can based on their Dibble score so that they're in a, a group of kids that are in similar level to them so that they're able to really focus instruction for those kids. So you can see on this slide um, the, the main instructional goal and then a lot of the strategies, a lot of the, pro, a lot of the components that we use are things that they do during the school year. They're just able to do them in a much more um, focused manner on each individual kid in the class. The second grade curriculum for the kids going into third grade is a, an American Reading Company curriculum about bugs. They're learning how to research, and this is the first year that we had live bugs included in the program, so it was very exciting. Um, ants and ladybugs and spiders and butterflies. I had to unpack the spiders, and it was a whole ordeal. But we did, <laughs> but we did get them into the classrooms without losing any. Mr. D was there just in case they went running around the building to clean them up. 
Um, we are housed at Post Road in the summer because of um, the fact that it's air conditioned and it's a comfortable building for the kids. So this year for the first time, speaking with Kathy Barpoulis, who's our K-6 math um, instructional our, our coordinator, um, we noticed that there is need based on our math data in this district for kids to get some targeted math instruction as well. So we wanted to bring that to the early, earlier grades, right? That's where we can capture them. Um, so we did implement a math program this year and it basically was was about 30 minutes each day. We were expecting um, the teachers to work with kids on math. And it was very much aligned with um with some of the programs that we use in the district. So in first and second grade, they use Do the Math, which has a lot of built-in assessments, which is really great because you could really see how the kids were progressing as they were in the summer school program, which is only 19 days. And then for K, it was very much aligned with the information that they use from the um, common, form common formative assessment for those kids. So we took a, some of the components from there to really focus on with the kids in the summer. So it was the first step, and we implemented a pretty strong program with a lot of help from Kathy, and we're gonna continue to refine that. So the next slide is really about the math. And um, again, you can look at that information in more depth later. And if you ever have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. So of course, you can't have a program with Mr. West without having music. So um, we start every morning, just to highlight some of the other things that we do. Um, we start every morning with, with music, with singing and dancing. I sing with the kids. I teach them about nine or 10 songs through the course of this 19-day program. Um, so every morning we meet in the auditorium and we spend a few minutes just um, singing some songs, doing some movement. You know, there's research that shows that that wakes up both sides of your brain, right? If you sing and you move at the same time, it uses both sides of your brain. So it's a great way to get kids kind of um, active and awake and engaged and ready to go to their classrooms. So we do that every morning and, and they love it. 96% of them love it. <coughs> um, and Mr. Ricca, Dr. Ricca actually came and was able to see what we do in the morning one day. He visited us several times over the summer, which was really great. And um, he even, of course, took a little video and it appeared on Twitter <laughs> before I knew he used it. And so someone said, oh, I saw you on Facebook last night. And I said, oh, excuse me? <laughs> So um, that was why. Thank you, Dr. Ricca. So, um, but it was, it's really a great experience for the kids, and it's a little bit of an enrichment activity, and I think it makes it a lot of fun for them. And uh, you can just see here how many sections we have per grade. And again, we had about 265 kids that attended this year. It's only 19 days. They're only there for two and a half hours. So it's not a long time with the kids, and so we do a lot with the little time that we have and we're committed to continuing to grow the program in terms of its, eff eff what's the word, efficacy, thank you, in terms of its efficacy for our kids. And so we're looking a lot at the data that we gathered over the course of the program in math, because we have a lot of pre and post assessments. And then in terms of the literacy, we're going to be looking at the Dibbles um, scores after the first round of Dibbles in the district and comparing those with what the kids did at the end of the year last year. And of course, that's always a little tricky because you know they have a whole five or six weeks after the summer school program is over that they're not in school, but we do look at that because we need to look at something. Right, And Dr. Ricca was able to come right before the end of the program and he read um, The Ninja Bread Man to two of our first grade classes, one of which was Miss Mallow. So if anyone knows Miss Mallow or has ever been in her classroom, she has pretty much every book known to man um, in her classroom. And she did not know this book, which is shocking. And uh, Dr. Ricca shared that it was one of his son's favorite books. So he came and read it to the kids and they just really, really enjoyed that. And it was a great, um, cum um, activity for them to do at the end of the school year. So thank you for doing that. So again, please take a look at the slides. If you ever have any questions, I'm very happy to talk to you about it. But that's kind of the program in a nutshell. All right. Singing and dancing in the morning was wonderful. Um, the big fight at home taking Harrison's book to bring to Mr. Mrs. Miles' class was tough, but, but he, uh, he understood. Yes, why? Um, we, we have a, a fantastic extended school year program in the district, and we thought it appropriate to give a, a brief update on our ESY program as well. Sal Garten. Thank you. I'm here with Ibelise Pilardi, our summer school principal, to speak a little bit about extended school year. So extended school year is a little different than our other summer school programs because it's mandated by regulation to meet the needs of students who have individual education plans throughout the school year. 
It's intended to meet the needs of students who have our most significant learning challenges and who would otherwise demonstrate significant regression if we did not provide this service. The time, the length of the school day, and the length of summer school is mandated through regulation. So it's a six, uh, five hour day, five and a half hour day, and it's a six week program. This year we ran 11 classrooms and we serviced all our students, grades K through age 21. We were able to um, service all of our students using our own staff which is really a testament to the teachers and the teaching assistants and the related service providers of the White Plains City School District because often summer school people take off and our staff elects to come here and continue to work with their students. It provides continuity for our students and it really makes summer school seamless for them. So the goal of summer school is really just to sustain whatever academic, social, and behavioral skills they've learned during the school year. And Ms. Pilardi is going to share with you how we do that. Good evening. Good evening. So as Ms. Ogarden mentioned, our goal is to prevent regression, um, not only in the content areas, as well as in the social skills and life skills areas. Um, this year, we were fortunate enough to be able to um, bring our students to the Greenberg Nature Center on two separate occasions, where they got to not only experience um, a presentation from the Greenberg Nature Center staff, they also got to walk around and enjoy. Um, each year, they have different um, present different presentations. This year was a butterfly exhibit, so they were able to enjoy that um, and enjoy the facility as well. We spent a day there, had lunch, a picnic, so it was a really great experience for our students. Um, we also partnership with the farmer's market, which allows our students to visit the farmer's market. There's a lot of planning that goes into this visit because our students have to be well prepared so they can um, be able to en enjoy the experience. Um, we are hoping to expose them to different community activities so that it would facilitate these outings with their own families. Um, sometimes simple outings for our, some of our special needs families is, is, is challenging. So by our, us exposing them to these different activities will help them um, be able to do that with their own families. Um, community day was another day where we had our police department, sanitation department, as well as the fire department come. And we had a great activity in the parking lot of um, Post Road. Dr. Rico was able to join us as well as um, the mayor. Uh, our students had an amazing day. Um, each department got to show off their skills that day, so it was great. Um, classroom academics, as we mentioned, we, we focus on using the same curriculum, the ABLES curriculum that we use for most of our classes during the year. Um, and we try to incorporate some fun because it is um, summer. So we incorporate Fun Fridays where our students get to do a lot of hands-on activities. Um, they learn how to make ice cream from scratch and other things as well as having our um, <laughs> Fun Fridays with where they get to play with water thanks to the assistance of Mr. D who's always available and willing to help us with all the all that stuff that goes into making that um, making that happen. So although our goal is to prevent regression and to maintain skills and content, social skills and life skills, is also to introduce our students um, to our community so they can have a connection to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Middle and high school. Paul is here. Mr. Ferry? Oh, that's big. <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of trouble then, wouldn't we, Gary? <laughs> I think we would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Good evening. Um, myself, Mr. Ferry, and Mr. Laporte ran the secondary summer school program. The secondary summer school program consists of middle school and high school. Our <clears throat> middle school <clears throat> program consisted of seventh and eighth grade. Um, we had 22 seventh graders and 33 eighth graders. Our main focus was uh, along, uh, similar to Mr. West's program in regards to math. We worked closely with Mr. Laporte as the assistant principal of summer school and as well as the math coordinator to identify specific needs within the eighth grade, seventh and eighth grade math curriculum. So um, to basically make sure that the kids were comfortable before moving on to the next grade. And then we also worked on um, giving them some skills, some preset skills where they can go into eighth grade or ninth grade and be ready for the eighth grade curriculum or the algebra curriculum. 
In addition, we had a seventh grade and eighth grade ELA block where they focused on um, basically um, reinforcing their literacy, literacy skills through test-based test activities. Um, and in addition, we had a project venture component where they worked on problem solving skills and team building skills. Um, so that was the middle school program. And then within the middle school, we also had an AVID Excel program, which is a program for our ELL students so that they can continue to build their academic language, their leadership, leadership skills, and you know, reinforce their commitment to school. Um, that's the overall math of the middle school program. And then at the secondary level, or the high school level, I should say, our focus is on um, credit recovery and, in re and uh, preparing them to pass the Regents exams. So as you can see on the chart, um, this is our success rate by uh, exam by category. So we have three different categories in um, um, high school, summer school. There is the credits where kids, students are taking the course for credit as well as trying to pass that Regents exam that's attached to it. Then there's students who have passed the class, but they need to pass the, the associated Regents exam. And then there's the RO sections, which are the students who did not attend. So as you can see, overall, students who attended the summer school program did better than those who, did, who are our ROs or our walk-ins. RO, uh, it's Regents only are walk-ins, are students who prepare on their own, have tutors, um, and they come in just the day of the exam. And the audit, um, do those kids attend class? The, the audit students attend class just as if they, they, you know, if they were taking it for credit, but they don't need the actual credit. They just need to, uh, support to pass the Regents exam. Um, we had a 32% fail the actual summer school course, but we had a 68% 68, 68 pass rate. Um, we had an overall enrollment of 285 students in our first period class, and in our second period class, we had 233 students, and we had three graduate from um, summer school, two of which are on their way into the workforce, and one is who is headed into the Marines. So that's secondary summer school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So briefly, we, we uh, of course welcomed everybody back last week and it was fantastic to see all of our children in, in all our buildings. And I just want to thank everybody um, for all of their hard work and making sure that the schools were ready. Uh, it was really a great day and, and it's been a, a great day ever since and, and it doesn't come without a, a lot of teamwork. So thank you very much, everyone. Also, congratulations to, uh, to Eastview. They were, or I should say, their program, um, Girls for Tech and Code, was recognized by MasterCard CEO as a, uh, a Force for Good award-winning program, which uh, of course means they are going to receive additional funding so that the program can continue to, to move forward. But again, it's also a nice highlight for, for Eastview and, and for the school district as a whole um, and our continued work to provide enrichment opportunities um, for our students, in this, in this case particularly for girls involved in STEM. Now, the moment we've all been waiting for, Mr. Stefanelli, an update on our facilities. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Dr. Ricca. First, I'd like to just thank the board, uh, Dr. Ricca, and then Dr. Karataish for the support, you know, over the summer and over the school year. <clears throat> couldn't help, couldn't get it done without the support of the board. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is it was a busy summer, so my head custodians, my custodian staff, I like to really thank them because it seems every year with, as you saw with the curriculum and all the summer activities, we have less and less of a time frame to get things done. And it's very difficult sometimes when we're doing construction and we have students in the building because we try not to do it at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> some of our projects, and I'll just go through them very quickly. You know, district-wide, uh, we had stage rigging. We replace all the stage rigging at all our schools. Uh, most of our schools, some of that stage rigging looked like it was there when it was originally installed. And we had a contractor who came in and told us, you know, he wouldn't really hang anything on our rigging. So that was why we went through and we did an extensive, all summer it took us to do all the schools. Uh, we did staff, uh, Church Street. I mean, if you look at the other paving, we did the high school, George Washington, Church Street, Ridgeway. The city came in and relined all our schools as part of our joint facilities. 
So I'll just go by each of the schools real quickly. These are major items, you know, besides the cleaning and all the other stuff. I'm just touching on some maintenance things that we did. We installed new locking hardware for the security update on, on the schools. So Church Street was finished this summer. We did staff restroom improvements, which was on the list for the last two or three years. The faculty was at chasing me. Uh, sidewalk replacements. Uh, we did the lower corridor floor tile. I think it got flooded one too many times and then tiles were picking up. We provided utility and roof penetrations for the food service. Uh, I don't know why they put it in the actual kitchen, so it made it twice as hot in the kitchen to have all that refrigeration equipment. So we moved it out and put it on the roof where it should have went. Uh, George Washington, uh, the auditorium and the gym uh, locker, we put, we did hardware as part of the security assessment audit that we did. Uh, the faculty room drainage, we had water coming into the faculty room from the grade, so we took care of that. Uh, this is one of the picture here is that we put a new path around the playground because it seemed like when we had special events, people were driving on the playground wrecking the surface. So I got tired of fixing it. So we, we actually did something to put a path around it so they could drive. Uh, and then we, we did some uh, abatements, floor replacements, and then we also replaced the entire ceiling in the library and in the computer lab and we put LED lighting, which is it is really neat now. It, the prices have come down. They look like little wafers, the fixtures themselves. So it's pretty, pretty easy to install. And we're going to be doing that throughout the district. <clears throat> Maranek Avenue, we, we, we started with a floor replacement. We thought it was going to be simple floor replacement. But you know, we didn't know there was three layers. And the, the third layer was something that we had to have abated. So, uh, so that was one of the things that we had to take care of. And we came in late in the summer. We put. We we're changing all the fountains. So most of the students, we put uh, water fountains that have bottle fillers. So now the PTA bought the students, they're all bottles. So now they're filling up the bottles. It's a real success at MAS. And we're starting to roll it out to most of the other schools. Uh, we replaced the domestic hot water. We did, some, we did some concrete pads and stuff like that. Post Road, it is getting older and we're using it more and more as a full-time school. Uh, but we lost our first heat pump. It just so happens if you talk about design, and I wish, I wish the engineer was here tonight to talk about that. But we ended up cutting the unit out, and we had to take half the ceiling down to get the unit out. So, so that's our first one. I think that uh, in the future, we're going to see more in that as the building starts to age, and these things are 10 years old, so they're going to start aging out. Uh, Ridgeway, we just did floor abatements too in the PPS suite. New casework in 105, 107, 109, 111, 113, 123. You know, the floor, we sanded and recoded the floors. And I think we did most of the gyms in, throughout the district. So I don't know why I just put it here, but it was throughout. Uh, we had a sump pump replacement, tree, tree pruning. We did that throughout the district. Uh, Highlands, we painted the entire corridors and halls. We put new lockers, which we did in the, in the uh, previous school year. During the uh, school year, we actually replaced most of them. Uh, <clears throat> we did flooring repairs. We did fence replacements, shades, drainage improvements. You know, there's a couple of classrooms that were flooding every time we had some big rains, so we decided to fix that. Uh, Eastview, as you see, that we, it was, I thought it was slowing down, but it didn't really slow down. But we had Family Services, Westchester moving in. We had old classrooms that we weren't part of the original construction. We had to get them ready for Family Services. I hate to say that I think they just got all the furniture in. I think they got approval, so they're going to have students start coming in, I think, this week. Uh, so you'll see if somebody's going to the uh, thing, you could go around and you'll be able to see it firsthand. The high school, we put all new shades throughout the, dis throughout the school, actually. I think those mini blinds had seen better days. We put a new projector in the uh, auditorium, new lockers and C-wing, as you see the picture. They go with the school colors. It really makes the corridor pop as the kids are walking down. We had to rebuild the boilers and A-wing. That, that was quite a feat. It's just about finished now. We're just starting them up this week, get them ready for service. We did some floor abatements. We put a new rubber floor in the tiger's den and we repiped the uh, utilities around the data center so that hopefully we, we don't get a leak and, and it doesn't flood out our data center. 
And then finally, Rochambeau, we did some work. Ed House, we did some drainage improvements. But moving forward, I just want to real briefly is that, you know, we're still doing some hardware replacements. We did major the classrooms, but now we're going back and doing all of them. Uh, we have domestic backflow we're putting in. We're doing restrooms in the basement of Post Road for the field use. We're uh, doing ball field drainage improvements. We're in design. Ridgeway, we're doing steel door replacements. We're doing exterior restroom. That's going to go on the field. Highlands, we're doing the stage plaster wall. The bids came in twice the price that we were estimated to be, so that's going out to bid. We need a new UPS system. We're redoing all the lighting in the stairwells at, at uh, Highlands, converting the same fixtures to LEDs. Uh, exterior restroom, the buildings are built. They're ready to be delivered. We're getting ready to put, pour the pads. That's going to start soon. The field house, we'll hope to have natural gas there, the lines there, We're waiting for O&R to connect it. The equipment's being installed now. Hopefully by uh, mid-October or shortly we'll have heat. Uh, District-wide initiatives, we had did the security audit. We're starting to go through some of those and get the, that work done. The high school, the generator's under construction. We're just waiting for the gas service to be, get hooked up there and get approved. Uh, air conditioning and fitness room is under construction. Most of that work's done. The pathway, the door replacements, the pool LED, it's under the design. Uh, intercom system, we're gonna replace it entirely. So there's STEM room, classroom design, and then Last but not least, the electric transformers. We just found out that our transformers are overheating. We're over 80%, and that's usually the code, about 80% of capacity. So we are there. We're going to have to do a, we're going to have to look at replacing this, upgrade the service at the high school. So that's going to be a definite if we're going to increase the air conditioning system. So that's the end if you have any questions. Yes. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, because we always call you. I, I have to say to everyone, we always call Frank because we always use our facilities. So whenever we see something, Frank could get a comment, he can get an email, he can get a call where, look, I was on the field and I saw X, Y, and Z. So thank you for being receptive to that. And our, uh, our last presentation this evening, uh, Dr. Hand is going to share with us uh, an update related to the New York State standardized assessment data. Thank you for the opportunity to review the New York State testing data for ELA and for math grades 3 through 8, as well as Regents data for middle school and for high school levels. As we review and analyze the data, it's important for us to remember that these standardized exams, especially in grades 3 through 8, are one snapshot of a student's performance and what they do in school from a daily and a yearly perspective. As a district, we can use the data to help us plan and make necessary adjustments to our curriculum and instruction. And these are really basic preliminary reports. But we have access to much deeper levels of data that can be disaggregated to help us understand subgroup performance, grade level performance um, by subject, and also by standards. So you know, we can really drill down into it. So this is just really, truly an overview of our performance. And as we go through it, we'll also mention how, um, you know, due to, um, due to a lot of different um, circumstances, uh, it's, it's not easy data to interpret um, as well. So we have to take it, you know, for, for its value, for its face value. The first thing um, as we enter our ELA data is we noted slight decreases in grades and in grades three and four. If you look our, at our third grade performance, um, there was a decrease from the previous year in 2016 of 47% per proficiency to 44%. Um, and in grade four, th from a 43 to a 37. However, in grades five and six, seven, and eight, we see increases. Um, so I'm going to go through the next data slide so that you can see grades 6, 7, and 8 as well. And then just to highlight um, the grade 8 that is, was illustrating a 7% gain in proficiency rating. Um, I might as well mention it now, though, because with opt-outs and children having non-tested test scores, the end values change on these graphs from year to year, plus the fact the test has changed it's gone from a time test to an untimed test 
to a three-day test with this many multiple choice questions and this many extended response questions. So you're really not comparing test to test. So again, it's just kind of like an overview. Um, and the cohorts are different as well. So it's nice when you see the increases and then when you see the decreases, you feel a little like what, what's going on here, but it's not so easy to answer. So I just want you to know that we'll carefully review everything, but we put all the other data together as well, everything else that we have with our children's performance throughout the year. Um, if you look at our cohort data for ELA, you'll see that um, as the children, and so how this chart is read, it says 24, 2014 to 2017, because they have started the grade level that's the beginning of their bar graph within that year span. So 2014, 2015, 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017. So in um, grade three, do I have the right? Yes, so in grade three, we had, um, I'm going too fast. I'm flipping, I'm looking at a different chart, sorry. So in grade three, as the children move from grades three, four, and five, you'll see what their performance was as fifth graders this year, how they performed in third grade, and how they performed in fourth grade in the previous years. The cohort performance for four, five, and six, the same way. That's our current sixth grade, when they were fourth graders, when they were fifth graders, when they were fourth graders, same thing, grades five, six, and seven, current seventh graders as they were performing at the sixth grade level and at the fifth grade level. And so you'll see that in grades, uh, in the cohort span of our sixth graders, our seventh graders, and our eighth graders in ELA, we have seen that level of increase in our, in our cohort performance. In the third, fourth, and fifth grade, our current fifth graders, we see that decrease from fourth grade, but you'll see that across the state as well, because the fifth grade test is, is, is a bit different. It does get a little bit challenging. So when we see our fifth grade test scores ourselves going up, we'll see that eventually that will catch up with them as they move up through the grade levels, if that makes sense to you. And then if we look at our math scores, our math scores in three, four, and five, we'll see a, an increase in performance for our third graders from the previous cohort for, to 46% from 37, and that's 9%. A slight decrease in fourth and fifth, and then we go into seventh and uh, sixth and seventh, we see uh, a gain in that um, from one year to the other of 12% for proficiency from that 28 to the 40, so that was a very nice gain for our sixth grade. And then from in the seventh grade is that slight, that slight gain from 34 to 35. Grade eight, it's important to note that many of our students in grade eight take the regents exam and their regents performance, we'll go over in a minute, but the children who are taking the actual eighth grade exam um, their their um, proficiency rating is at 8%, which is a gain from our previous cohort, but we def definitely need to um, target attention to our eighth grade taking Math 8. In their cohort data performance for mathematics, you will see um, the gains as the children have moved through third grade, fourth grade, and fifth grade. Again, it's the same way that we read the cohort data for ELA that the 2017 is the current year or last year when they were taking the exam. I wanted to point out the, the sixth grade. Sixth grade, we saw that nice gain in mathematics. So when they're going through the cohort, even though we see that slide from the 46, 45 to 40, we have to remember that was the grade level where we saw that performance move from that 28 up to the 40. Again, you know, not, not so easy to interpret when you're just looking at one graph sep separately. And then, of course, that sixth to eighth grade performance, once we bring in the algebra data and we see from sixth grade to eighth grade, our eighth graders taking the algebra and also taking the math aid exam, making that gain from 35 to 34 to 58 as they move through that sixth, seventh, and eighth grade cohort. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about test refusal and how complicated test refusal gets in, um, in really taking our scores and, and making meaning of them. They actually have given us from state data um, 
just in terms of our percentage of students who were eligible to participate in the test last year, uh, who refused the test was 16.4%. Out of that 16.4%, 35.8% of those students had refused in the previous year. So they were second year refusal. Um, of those second year refusals, that's where we can disaggregate the data further to say how many of those students were level one, level two, level three. And you can see from the chart that it was 17.3% for level one, 21.4 for level two, 12.8 for three, and 3.1 for four. So when you're looking at our refusals, there's consistency to some degree in the value, but then the other group of children that opted out this current year had, didn't have test scores for the last year too, or had test scores for the last year, I should say. And then the economically disadvantaged, the 49.3%, it's kind of like puts us in the middle. You know, sometimes districts or we're saying that, you know, a certain group of children opt out here, it's kind of, it evens out across the, the different populations. So interpreting the data, I kind of talked through the slides when we were going through them, but some highlights and steady gains that we've made in ELA that we're seeing through um, grades six through grade eight is that grade six data from 2015 to 2017 has illustrated gain in proficiency from 28 to 35 percent. Grade seven through the same year spans, pr proficiency from 26 to 36, and grade eight data illustrated a gain in proficiency from 29 to 42. Strong cohort performance in ELA that I pointed out was that cohort from fifth to seventh grade in ELA, last year's current seventh graders, from fifth grade to seventh grade, we saw their gains in proficiency move from 28% as a cohort to 36%. The same thing in grades six to eight, we saw that gain in proficiency from 28 to 42%. In math, um, to highlight for the grades three through five and grades six to eight cohort, three to five, made in math that gain as a cohort starting in third grade at 35% as a cohort, they moved into fifth grade at 44%, and then for the sixth to eighth grade co cohort, 35 to 58%. It's a lot easier to talk about summer school and to talk about facilities than test scores out loud. Um, in, in 2016 and 2017, the proficiency of grade eight students scoring at or above 65 on the algebra regions has been 100% for the two years in a row. So we wanted to highlight that as well. So challenges and areas for growth. A challenge is the number of test refusals in each grade level and the changes to the state exam. Like I told you, it's just really diff difficult to interpret this with absolute values. Um, another challenge is in, in, in improving the performance levels of our subgroups, particularly, especially our special education and, and limited English proficient students as a subgroup. Um, an area for growth would be improving our participation rate for our students in each grade and subject as per the federal and state regulations of taking the exams so that results are stronger. In indicators of, of our performance. The other thing is the state will be changing the test this year to a two-day test. We still have a three-day window, but the exam will only be given on two days in ELA and mathematics, so that is definitely a plus for us. And areas of growth, just continuing to improve our resources. Thank you to the Board of Education and to, um, to Anne as well for supporting us with the budget to make sure that we can put the best resources and refine our instructional practices in our classrooms. We made a lot of investment. We made a great investment in classroom libraries in the elementary schools this summer. Uh, we invested in math materials for middle school and up through high school. So we're really working hard to improve you know, our daily instruction that our children um, you know, are engaged in every single day. And then also to share practices, practices across classrooms, across grade levels, and across school buildings when we look at the data you know, deeper. So the next few slides, um, Regents results for the middle school highlands. You'll see the Regents results for algebra one and geometry, and also for earth science. And um, the first bar graph is for 2016, the second is for 2017, so you'll see consistency in the math, and you will see growth in the earth science. And then the final slide, don't cheer, but the final slide is 
the region's results and the percent of 65 or above at proficiency. And again, there's a chart for 2016 results and 2017 results, and then the bar graphs are on the top. And you'll see that we're fairly consistent. The one thing that I want to note when looking at these charts, especially for the algebra, the geometry, and the earth science, is that we have the children that are taking them in eighth grade, so they are, they are already disaggregated as eighth graders in this data from, from the high school. But there's consistency, and we see areas for growth, and you know, we'll use this to continue to plan. And I just wanted to you know, end by saying thank you to the board, and thank you to our administrators, and our principals, and our coordinators, and our directors, and all of our teachers, and parents, and especially our students who work so hard every single day, and never forget that they can't just be measured by a test. So that's very important to me. Thank you, Dr. Hand. Thank you. And then uh, just real quick, a reminder, uh, we have the big kickoff for dads uh, take your child to school day. That the kickoff's actually going to be this Thursday at Ridgeway. And, and we're pretty excited about that because it's going to be the, the kickoff for the entire county. Um, we also have some, some uh, guidance nights coming up. Uh, college application night, I think, is coming up, right, Ms. Hall? Um, and then, of course, dad take your child to school day on the 19th. Next week, we have open houses and picture days. Um, lots going on, so please make sure you take a look at the calendar. And then uh, something real special, Peace One Day, uh, right at the high school is going to be taking place um, on the 20th as well. So uh, lots, lots, of, lots of great things happening all throughout the district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots going on. Uh, we're going to move to our summary action items, but before we do that, I'll need a motion to remove um, under Section 8, Aiden Meshaj, uh, so his certification can be reviewed. May I have a motion? So moved. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have 21 summary action items. May I have a motion? So moved. Yes, 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 yes. Um, thank you very much. I, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the White Plains Substitute Teachers Association for the Guy Matthews Scholarship Fund donation of $2,460.06 as well this year. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, we'll move to other action. We have the recommended approval of the administrative appointment of Rosemary Ampha, uh, Director of Secondary Special Education, um, probationary period October 11, 2017 to October 10, 2021. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, you're here. Well, yeah. Here. yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? You don't have to. If you don't have to. Okay. Hey, thank you. <laughs> okay. Just, just wave. And <laughs> thank you. Uh, can I, do you mind if I? I just. I, I'd also like to uh, to recognize. Uh, Kirby's here with us as well today, and she uh, just received tenure. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, next, under bids and contracts, may I have a motion for the approval to amend the Special Education Services RFP, which was previously approved on June 26, 2017. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions, which I think we all answered. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, we have the recommended approval for the superintendent to enter into an agreement with the city of White Plains for school resource officers in an amount not to exceed $287,000. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next, we have the recommended acceptance of the audit committee minutes from uh, August 28, 2017. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Next, we have the recommended acceptance of the internal auditor report for the Human Resources Department and correction, Corrective Action Plan. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. You have any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, we have the recommended acceptance of state and federal grant budgets. May I have a motion? So moved. <laughs> Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, we have the recommended approval of non resident tuition agreements for the STAR program. May I have a motion? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next, we have the recommended acceptance of the free and reduced price meal program, including family income eligibility guidelines and certification. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Next, we'll move um, to board discussion on the revised policy for um, cellular telephones. Are we okay with that? So I guess we'll have that on an upcoming agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, next, this is the first, first this reading. The first, the reading. Reading. The first for reading. For the viewing audience, for the, it, it yeah. would be good to describe what we're doing here. Yeah, sure. We, uh, very, very, <laughs> simply, yes, yes. Very, very simply, very um, simply, we're amending the the present cellular telephone policy to uh, to ensure that for folks who don't utilize a district-owned uh, telephone but or cell phone but use their own um, for, for work purposes, basically 24-7, 365, that they can be reimbursed um, a portion of their monthly bill. So this is, this is the first reading. We get to read it and uh, ask any questions before it's formally adopted. Thank you. Sure. So next we'll have board committee reports. The finance, um, the finance committee met and our minutes were approved, um, and uh, human resources met, but we can't discuss that in great detail. <laughs> mm -hmm. a combined meeting. Yeah, it was a combined meeting. That's right. Curriculum and instruction next week, and special ed the week after. Sure. We just talked. Let's have some. Yeah, I have questions for you guys. Okay. If there's nothing else, um, I'd just like to recognize John Shepard and Carlos Alvarez in the back, keeping us on and in the Nielsen ratings. Thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> uh, may I have a motion to in enter into exec session to discuss personnel matters? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.